Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Kevin Velk, and today we welcome the cast and creative team behind Disney's Zootopia. So first, I'd like to welcome Byron Howard, director, and director Rich Moore, producer Clark Spencer, Jennifer Goodwin, Katie Lowe's, Tommy Chung, and Nate Torrance, our voice Woo. cast. How are you guys? Welcome, guys. Yeah. It's a cavalcade of stars. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Zoogle. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so thank you guys so much for being here today. Uh, obviously, we're talking about Disney's latest animated film, Zootopia. And so Byron and Rich, you guys directed the film. Can you just talk to us about what the story was and, and the genesis of this? Sure. How did it all start? How did it all begin? Well, OK, so five years ago, after I uh, finished directing Tangled with Nathan Greno, um, John asked what I wanted to do next, and what you do when you pitch to John Lasseter is he doesn't want you to just pitch one idea. He wants to get an idea of what your interests are and what you're passionate about. So Nathan and I, I think, pitched six different ideas, and one thing that all those six ideas had in common was this idea of anthropomorphic animals, which are animals that walk upright and wear clothes and uh, use cell phones. And he got so excited about the idea that he literally hugged me and picked me up off the ground and lifted me into the air like baby Simba. He's very strong. strong. He's a strong man. man. A mighty man. <laughs> so we knew we had something that John was interested in, and because he grew up on Wind in the Willows, which is a film from like the 40s or 50s, and I grew up on Robin Hood, and I think, Rich, your first film? I grew film. up on uh, The Jungle Book. Jungle Book, that's right, that's right. So we knew we had this great Disney legacy to build on, but we didn't want to do something completely new. So we did a year of research, including going to Africa. No kidding. They sent us to Africa with 15 of our leadership to do research and <laughs> nearly get eaten. Our cinematographer. Why did you go, Katie? Should have gone. Would you have loved to go to Africa? <laughs> yeah. The bugs. Are oh, my gosh. The smells. Yeah. Our cinematographer got bitten by multiple animals, yeah. including like a zebra and an, an ostrich and a, a cheetah. Pounced, pounced on by a yeah. cheetah. Yeah. <laughs> but, that, but we care about your entertainment. That's why. We, <laughs> we'll put our we'll lives on the line. That's right. <laughs> to bring you comedy and heart. That's right. <laughs> And so, Rich, when did you come onto the project? Because you were probably on Wreck-It Ralph when this started. Um, yeah, I was. Wow, that was five years ago. Well, but and I was. A, I'm a member of the Story Trust at the studio, uh, which is uh, all our colleagues, the directors, uh, writers, and heads of story, and uh, we help each other with with our films. Um, we're there to support uh, the other director, uh, the other directors, and uh, I had been kind of following this one. And there's some that you follow more intimately than, than others. And, and I had been following this one from the beginning. From the early part, yeah. Back when it was a spy movie. That's where it started. It was a spy <laughs> yeah. movie when we started. With, with Little did we know right. that's what it would evolve into. And, and uh, so, so I'd been kind of with this one from the beginning as, as a support you know, system, part of the support system. And there was a moment about a year and a half ago as, as these movies always have like a bump in the road, you know, and uh, this one was a pretty big one where we wanted to try switching the main characters or the protagonists because for the longest time, uh, Nick, the Fox character, Jason Bateman's character, was the protagonist. He was the main character. Uh, and the story was just not coming together um, in that way. So we said, why don't we try flipping you know, Judy and Nick and, and let uh, Judy be kind of our eyes and ears coming into this new world and lo and behold, the, the story just kind of laid out, you know, at our feet. And we're like, oh, great, you know, we, we figured it out. But, oh, great, now we have to make all these changes, you know. And we only have about a year and a half to get this thing finished. So uh, it was obvious it was a two-person job. Uh, and John Lasseter said, could you jump? You know, the, you know the movie pretty well. Could you jump on with Byron, you know, and, and see it through to the end? Clark, does this freak you out as producer when they say, <laughs> let's just start over and flip the story around? You know, it's interesting. The, you realize the most important thing is telling a great story. And so definitely in that moment, you think to yourself, are we really going to be able to turn this around? But what we try to do, and we do it a lot in animation, is we very quickly make a new version of that film. And I always feel like we have the other version sitting on a shelf over here. Let's go experiment, because we need to know for sure whether this is the right idea or not. And when we did it, we turned it around in about six weeks. You could just see this was the right way to go. You really fell in love with Jennifer's character right away. You were rooting for that character, which is the thing we were struggling with, with Nick's character, because he's a cynical kind of a character. It was really 
easy to get on to Judy's side, and it just felt like it was the right thing. So at that moment in time, you just start working with the team. Can and we say, out how please, to Clark, it please, can we do it this way? <laughs> please, can we have some money? Just a few more this. million, please. <laughs> it's going to be so little, good. Just a little Jennifer million. Jennifer likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Nate's on board? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Nate's had you. Yeah. Well, and your wonderful voice cast here. So, yes. uh, Jennifer, we'll start with you. Describe your character, Judy Hopps, uh, as a bunny. Yes. And so when were you pulled yes. into it and describe your character? Um, when, was, when was I pulled into I was pulled into it uh, to, I mean, it didn't take much pulling. Yeah, yeah. Because um, well, you're, you're a huge Disney fan, right? I'm a Disney-file, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, th by the way, this is a true story of my getting cast. I was in Mickey Mouse pajamas and I was pregnant with my first and I was in my kitchen and I had a message from all of my agents, including my voiceover agent. And I thought I was being fired from a different job. Because <laughs> I just assumed, and I'm not actually, I'm actually a really like, you know, fiercely optimistic person like the character Judy Hopps, but I was just sure that why would everyone call me at once unless they were trying to like soften the blow. And so I, in my Mickey Mouse pajamas, I turned to my husband and I said, oh, I'm getting fired from this other job. And he said, or I swear this happened. He goes, or Disney's calling to offer you the lead in their next animated future. And I was like, that's mean. Like why would you like, don't do that to me. Like I'm obviously getting fired and I need support and Kleenex. And so I picked up the phone and I thank goodness got everyone on the phone at once. And they said, Disney is calling to offer you. And I lost it for obviously positive reasons. And I said, I'll take it. And they were like, don't you want to know what the job is? And I was like, no, I want this to be legally binding. So just call them <laughs> and say I'm in and then you can call me back and tell me what it is. Um, so yeah, cause it's a dream come true. And I didn't stop crying for like a day. But um, that was like, I mean, I was pregnant with my first kid. So that was like two and a half years ago. Oh, at this been a while. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the character Judy Hopps is a bunny on the police force of Zootopia. She's the first bunny. She's bought, been brought in by a, a, an integrative mammal initiative. And uh, she, she, <coughs> she takes her job seriously. She does not take herself seriously. But she is, she's a bit self-righteous, which I appreciate about her. She's, but like I said, she's fiercely optimistic. She's idealistic. She believes anyone can be anything. That like, like my dream was to be in a Disney and made a feature. Hers was to be a bunny cop and, and a, on a force full of predators. And uh, she moves to Zootopia from the outskirts called Bunny Burrow. And uh, she is faced with the reality that not everyone, uh, not only does, does everyone not live in the peace and harmony she assumed Zootopia was, uh, but but not everyone is even really looking to. And were you excited when they start when they decided to switch the main? When they said you are now going to be the star of the movie, I, I wasn't <laughs> upset about it. <laughs> did you call Jason up? But I did no, but I did when they did. I don't think I told you guys this, but when they did tell me, because it was a, they came up to Vancouver where I shoot a series once upon a time, and um, when I couldn't come down to uh, L.A. to record these guys and a couple of others were always very generous would come visit me in Canada and we would record up there. And there was a day we were like standing in the lobby going in and I asked how screening was going and one of you said like, oh, no one told you? And I was like, told me what? And they were like, we rewrote the movie and like you've got some more work to do. And I had to like not jump up and down because like who doesn't want to be told like, because I was having the time of my life, like you're going to do this a whole lot more. And um, I, but I actually called my Represent. I called my agents to be like, will you call and make sure that they weren't teasing me? Because like, how much like, more does it, it pay? Was a joke. Do I get a raise? <laughs> <laughs> this <is still> <laughs> right, this is still legally binding. Yeah. Okay. And then Katie, um, it was what I, what I always found amazing, which I didn't know, was that actually you've been in a lot of Disney movies. You were in Big Hero 6, Rick and Ralph, Frozen Feet. Yes. And so now you play Dr. Honey Badger. Yes. Right? Yes. I. Um, I was brought into the Disney family a while ago before Scandal. My husband, it's take your husband to work day today because we're at Google and my husband's so pumped about it. Um, <laughs> hi, Adam. And so about maybe like seven or eight years ago, I'm, I'm a waitress, I'm a babysitter, I'm a caterer, I'm all these jobs. And my friend worked at Disney and she asked if my husband and I would like to come into Disney once a week and just do improv games that we would play in acting school for a bunch of different animators at Disney. And we did that for about two years and we kind of got into the Disney family, thank God, um, through that. And um, slowly but surely I was able to meet Clark and Rich and Byron and um, 
and you know a lot of different people and that's how I ended up um, auditioning and working and getting a part in uh, Frozen, another part in Wreck-It Ralph and then this part in Zootopia and so I feel really lucky because it's like the best coolest family place to work like ever <laughs> so um, that's how I'm here. <laughs> and and, and your job is amazing because she's with us like very early on when we're developing characters yeah. And she'll do she'll do scratch dialogue for for Basically lots anything. of different characters and because to have like these guys in all the time I mean we would we would burn out our actors if if they're in there for every line that they need to deliver as we're making the the movie and Katie's really really great at helping us develop the the characters. Thanks, dude. Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I also wasn't I was I at the first table read for this? Wait, no, you were. Yeah, right? no, you were. I know, you right? Were yeah, I Nate. Because I think Nate and Katie. Yeah, I think you guys are the ones in the cast who really stuck from the very because we do table reads. Once we have a first draft of the script that everyone feels pretty comfortable about, we'll sit down and we'll hire, hire real actors, real talented actors, <laughs> not just us, to come in and read the script through. And the hope with that is that you're going to discover a couple people who actually stick. And these guys, and Nate was there as Clawhauser, and he definitely, he definitely stuck in a big way. We loved him. And then Katie was amazing. And so, and that's, that's the way, even with what you did with Ralph, was that you had, I think you had uh, uh, Sarah, didn't you? Did you? Yeah, Sarah and John and, and uh, Jack and Jane, Jane, they were all there, yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's it's a great you know first opportunity to hear the the voices of the characters to feel them kind of coming to life off yeah. the page. Um, I consider it like a, we talk about screenings that we do uh, with the films. I consider like the table read like a first screening yeah. almost, you yeah. know, just without the pictures. And John and Ed can tell too, like our, our bosses, they, like when they heard heard Nate, they're like, oh my God, you gotta keep that guy. <laughs> oh, he's so funny. And they're like, is he the guy in the Volkswagen commercial? Do you remember his Volkswagen commercial where he takes the test drive and he starts laughing like crazy? Because when I, when I first heard about Nate, Jamie, our casting director, said, you know, you know who would be great for Clawhauser is, have you ever seen that Volkswagen commercial where that guy just laughs the head, his that's ass awesome. off and like, oh my God, you got to get that guy. And so, and they- We and, can get him? I know. That's the thing. Like, <laughs> we made all our, we make our lists for these, uh, these characters. We make our top, like, picks for, we go through actors and actresses and we look and we kind of make our wish list, like a Christmas list for directors. And the weird thing is that we got all our top picks on this movie. So when we were at the Hollywood premiere like two weeks ago and saw these guys assembled as a group, that was surreal for us because it is such a powerhouse acting troupe. It's just, it's amazing. Well, then we'll go into Nate and then come back to you, Tommy. But Nate, I mean, your, your character's awesome. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Cla Thank so cool. um, he is a cheetah and just tell us about the character and his obsession with Shakira's yeah, 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 uh, yeah. character, so I, 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 Yeah, I, I play Officer Clawhauser, who ends up, I'm, uh, I, I'm the receptionist in uh, the ZPD, which is where Judy Hopps is, is going to you know, start work. So I kind of become one of maybe her first friends. The funny, the crazy thing is, is in the first table reads, I was one of Nick's best friends. And then that, that switch over happened. Like, that's what's always so crazy to watch the story you know, change. But yeah, so I get to um, be her biggest fan. And then also Gazelle's biggest fan. And Shakira. <laughs> she, that's what's kind of funny. I remember, I remember, like, that was always, like, in the storyline, I was obsessed with this pop princess, and it was so fun to be like, I wonder who it's going to be. Who's going to, who are they going to get? So, I'm lucky with Shakira. I'll take it. <laughs> what was it like meeting her uh, at the premiere? Did you, did you hear what I did? Oh, mm -hmm. I went, what happened? hi, Clawhauser, or er, Nate. <laughs> I literally did that. I, I introduced myself as Clawhauser. <laughs> like, you're nice. <laughs> That's phenomenal. And so then, Tommy, you play uh, Yaks, the yeah. Yak. And so tell, your character is ridiculous. And I love it. <laughs> I love it so much. And well, it, it was kind of weird, you know, when the, uh, I got asked to be in a Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's and funny. then uh, I, I didn't have to guess what kind of character I'd be playing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noted for one, and uh, and the yak, oh, he cracked me up, man. I mean, to be in a nudist colony of the animals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were talking about I this. Loved, I, I just loved everything about it. But the thing is, with Disney and I, had, we, we go back a ways, you know, because... Uh, I got offered a role in Lion King, and I turned it down. <laughs> right. Because uh, I got kicked out of Disney Park once for wearing a, an obscene T-shirt. 
<laughs> All is forgiven, right? Yeah. 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 Forgiven. Well, it's, it's a new generation, you know. Right. right. <laughs> Without doubt, you know. <laughs> Oh, so, uh, can you, can uh, uh, Rich and, and Byron, there's no segue, but uh, Rich and Byron, uh, <laughs> can you talk about just the, the casting of these guys and, and finding, you know, Jennifer and was it, oh, we have this crazy idea, let's do this, or you heard that voice, oh, let's write a character for that? Well, it's, we, we really work from archetypes when we look at the, our, our cast, you know, we, or our characters, you know, we needed... A, a fiercely determined bunny, you know, and a sly, charming fox, you know, and they have to kind of work, be on the opposite ends of the scale. Um, and the way that Byron and I like to, to work is just putting up like photos of, of people or characters or images of, of characters like that, like comparable, you know, people. And, and actors will just kind of bubble out of those photos, you know, and like Byron said, uh, Jennifer and Jason were our first picks, you know, for, for Nick and Judy, you know, and, and we look for not just the quality of voice or, or how they sound or uh, how they deliver lines, but it's the chemistry, you know, yeah. between them. And that's, that's why we also will record together when we can. Yeah, and it's, I think it's really tough. I think these guys don't get enough appreciation, people who do voice acting, because a, yeah. a lot of actors and actresses can't do it, because, I mean, it's, it's one thing to be photogenic and, you know, kind of a, a nice on, on camera, but when you're in a room by yourself and we're asking you to emote or make someone laugh or cry. Jennifer has this crazy scene in the film where she breaks down, and it's very genuine, and not everyone can muster that emotion and so I, I, and just it's even to be funny like Nate and uh, Tommy and, and Katie it's just there's something about that there's an extra layer of talent that I don't think people appreciate because we do we listen to a lot of people honestly for like for uh, Rapunzel for example we listen to 300 actresses for Rapunzel's role and 150 for Flynn oh, wow. and this this they that this film is a little different because we kind of knew who we wanted to go after and so we kind of made that the sort of wish list but it's incredible to see like how many people out there just kind of lack what these guys have in, sp in spades. It's, it's, just, it's an amazing talent. Right, and can we talk about the environments? Because the environments are incredible, and Clark, I kind of want to bring you into this in terms of, <laughs> you probably regulated that, because it's insane. I think the worlds just keep getting bigger and bigger with Disney when you had, you know, you see Big Hero 6 and you're flying over, you know, San Francisco, and it's just, it's beautiful and amazing, and I was like, oh my gosh. And you see Frozen, and with the Frozen world and everything, with, with the snow, and then with this, I mean, you have, Sahara Square, Tundra Town, Rainforest District, Little Rodentia, and Bunny Burrow. So can you just talk about dealing with that? <laughs> it's a lot of environments that cost, all Clark? different. Come on, Clark. There were a lot of production people gritting their teeth, <laughs> you know, and they heard about this world. You know, it's always hard, but we start with the world. It's interesting. John Laster always says you got to take the audience to a place they've never been before. So even sometimes before we think too deeply about the story, we think about the world. And I think early on, um, Byron and Jared and Rich were really thinking about how do we do a movie like a talking animal movie like no one's seen before and they came up with this idea that the animals should all live in their different districts like the cold weather animals live in Tundra Town and the hot weather animals live in Sahara Square and the mice characters live in Little Redentia and you started to see what a great world you were building. Um, so even though that meant it was going to be huge, from that standpoint, you realize, again, you're really going to support the story in an important way. And then, of course, all those characters are going to come together into the downtown part of Zootopia. And it really came from research, being in Africa and looking at the fact that there's a watering hole where all the animals come to every day. And around that watering hole, all of them get along. Giraffes are there with hippos and rhinos and, and lions. And then they go back to their respective areas uh, after they drink from the water. And that kind of gave us the idea for this city. So it is daunting in some ways, but I think just like working with Rich on Wreck-It Ralph, it's, we have to take the audience to a place they've never been before. We have to create something that makes what we're doing in animation and, and the use of the computers be used to their full capacity, and I think that's where it's really great to see what the animation community is doing today. And there were, there were even uh, worlds within the movie that we couldn't include, because it's a 90-minute film, so we can only fit so much of the world into 
what we're showing you guys, because there were districts that we actually cut out. We had Outback Island, which was an Australian district full of weird animals with pouches, and you were saying it's a good pickpocket joke. Things like that. <laughs> would have been great. Maybe next time. That would have been funny. It would have been funny. And then uh, we always talked about a nocturnal district under the city in caves and caverns. Wouldn't that be cool, right? Be uh, cool. Oh, it's be cool. cool. <laughs> but there was no room, right? So we gotta, we got to do another one. So, But it's, it is, there's, there, it, honestly, the world is so big, and the characters are so uh, fun and compelling. We could have gone any one of 100 directions and had a really fun story and it's it's just like when you pitch these movies at uh, work where we work we work with about 800 people all together on these films over a period of four or five years and th when you see uh, an idea start to light up and when you get the sort of the balance right and people start to come up with ideas on their own they start to pitch you ideas that's when you, we really know that we have something that's gonna work because that's what the audience is gonna do they're gonna look at that and they're gonna oh wouldn't it be great and we see it on uh, Twitter and Google and Facebook all the time, like with people kind of throwing in, like, hey, did you guys ever think of this? Oh, the fan that? art that comes in, that yeah, they share with us on Twitter. It's so great. It's amazing. You know, the, that's that's how we knew. That's how we know that we're doing our job well. You know, when when we we begin to engage with you know the audience and they begin to their imagination starts to run wild and they're you know drawing pictures and sending them to us and. That, as a filmmaker, that feels really, really good. Yeah, we're very open. I mean, I get the feeling from Google that you guys are like this too, but we're very collaborative, especially with these guys. I mean, when we bring in the voice talent, we don't want them to just read off the page. We're, we, we bring them in, we ask them to be in these films because of who they are as, uh, not just their acting persona, but who they are as human beings, and the fact that they can ad-lib and bring humor that we wouldn't expect or just or, or can't possibly generate on or on, there's so much that like just these four right here brought to the film that wasn't on the page, and that's that's another layer of talent. Where they, I mean, they get to the point where they know the characters better than we do. Yeah. You know, and totally. we, towards the end, it's just we're just giving these guys a jumping off point. Yeah. you know, to to explore. Yeah, you just let them go. And can you talk about just your favorite scenes from the movie without spoiling? It? Well, I, I I do want to say too, the film is absolutely phenomenal, but the trailers don't show a lot of it, which was phenomenal. Because I went to the film and thinking I was going to see one thing, the slot scene is amazing. In in full, by the way, the slot scene. Ninety is minutes of that. It's just <laughs> ninety minutes of that. <laughs> there could have been, slow. but it just takes a great turn. It's at a point, and it's. It's phenomenal. It, it's completely different than what I thought I was going to get, and it's it's a joy. But what were, what was your favorite scenes? That either do or just your scenes, the the scene that you saw the the final cut that you liked the most. My favorite two scenes are the like mob scene with the little <laughs> uh, yeah, Mr. Big that kills me. You guys will know what I'm talking about when you see it. And my other favorite scene, there's this, when you get introduced to the world, like you're talking about Clark, it's the first time that, um, you know, Judy Hopps is on a, this awesome speeding train and the kick butt Shakira song is blasting in her headphones and it's just like, you're seeing all the worlds that you just described and it's just, it's like Disney on, I mean, it's just the best at what you guys, it's just unbelievably inventive and magical and, something you've never seen. And I was moved to tears when I first saw it. Um, <laughs> it's Katie just gorgeous. Katie cries easily, you know, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> so those are my two. Yeah. And Jennifer? Um, my, my two favorites, it would actually give too much away, but I'll just say that my, my favorite two scenes were actually the ones that were the hardest for me to record. One of, what, well, one of which being the, a, a very emotional scene that was mentioned a few minutes ago, um, because I am so used to being live on camera and having, t you know, my face and my body and costumes and props and things to help express something. And it was like, not only am I just having to use my voice to convey this emotion, but I also, at a point, I think, was blubbering and incomprehensible. And they had to, like, pull me back a bit so you could actually hear what I was saying. <laughs> and then try to find a layer of comedy. Trying to find a layer of comedy on top of that was something I hadn't really, I don't know, it was a balance I hadn't had to really strike before in anything. Like I've either done, I feel, dramas or comedies. I haven't really been in something that was such a meld of those two genres. And then another scene that was my favorite that was the hardest film would totally be a giveaway, but it's just, it was, it's one of those like famous Disney emotional punch in the gut scenes that didn't actually involve as much of me as it was everything coming together once you have the animation and the music and uh, like it was just I don't it'll, I'd give it away if I was yeah. <laughs> but it's really good <laughs> it's really good <laughs> and Nate were you able to improv a lot because you came from that yeah, that was you know that yeah that's a, that my my background and that's what's cool is 
they kind of talked about it. it. It's so amazing when you, when you get in an environment where it is collaborative. And they actually, I mean, you guys, they got in the booth with with me. I don't know if it, I, I don't know if that what was your experience, but that's. I, I mean, I've, I haven't done a ton of. I, I've done two other actually series with TV or with uh, Disney, um, animation wise. But the coolness of like reading with them and being because it's a it's kind of like prison in that way. It's a big glass. <laughs> One, you know, you have the, the, the they're like, great job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, uh, you know, like, so, so you can have a little bit of a disconnect sometimes as an actor in the voiceover. But that they got in, and uh, you guys always were so, uh, there were times where I just kept talking forever. I remember <laughs> literally, like, I get them laughing, and I'm like, I'm just going to go for like three minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, yeah we, have but, uh, we have hours of you. We have hours. It's <laughs> yeah. oh, a little boy. ridiculous. <laughs> No, but I, I will say specifically, though, one of the cool things, it, it, which is a scene where, um, with the cell phone, oh, right. with, with, with uh, Gazelle, where there's like a, I don't, yeah, I don't want to give too much away, but there ends up being um, something where that was a little bit like that, where we got to play and to see it come to fruition mm -hmm. and, and make it, not that it's completely improvised, but, um, but you, you get to add a little bit to it. And that's always a cool thing as an actor to get okay, to do. Sure. How about you, Tommy? Well, you know, I had a lot of experience uh, doing Cheech and Chong albums, <laughs> you know, alone, with just Cheech and I and an engineer. So, you know, working with these guys was a piece of cake, you know, because <laughs> that's what we did. Uh, we, we'd get in front of a microphone and uh, just have an engineer, and then we'd just create with our imagination. And so it was uh, easy. And but when I saw the movie, I mean, I'm a big animated animation fan anyway, you know, because uh, in fact, we used to I had a nightclub in Vancouver and we had a, a little party for uh, kids when, you know, my son, my brother's uh, children had a birthday party and we showed animated uh, movies or, you know, cartoons and uh, the kids were oh, they watched it, but it was the adults that really got into it. And so we used to close the club down on Sunday and <laughs> put on the animation and just laugh ourselves sick. <laughs> and then play it over and over and over again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so when I, saw, when I saw this, it brought me right back to that world. <laughs> especially especially the, their scenes, there's a, the wolves howling. They're, oh my God. At that, I mean, and they're. There are bits in this movie where I, I'm, I'm want to see. I can't wait to see it again, yeah. because I want to feel that 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 humor and the humor uh, that in in this like a lot of animation, you know, it, it's the humor is kind of hidden, you know. But this one, uh, it was out in the open. It was so, <laughs> it was so crazy and so good. And 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 my character, I, I was I just recovered from. In fact, I came out of the hospital. I had an operation, and I came out of the hospital, and my son, who was my manager, he said, uh, we got a voiceover gig for you. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and I literally got taken from the hospital in the car into, into the recording booth. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and, and I'm standing there, and they're explaining the bit to me, you know. But like I said, I had all that experience with, with Cheech and Chong, so it was no problem, you know. Just say this, okay, no problem. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're really merciless. We're like, you had surgery, get in here. <laughs> we're cruel. Baby. Come on. My God, I mean, that was incredible. Thank you thank for you coming for in that, yeah. those <laughs> times. I mean, <laughs> anything for Disney. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and uh, with what I was most impressed with was right when the first kind of teaser trailer came out with the walk cycles of all the animals. So I kind of want to talk about what the technological hurdles were with this movie because that blew my mind because each animal had their a different walk cycle, a different ten tendency, and the animators really seemed like they were using all those features. Like there was a great scene that I saw when uh, uh, Judy Hopps, uh, Jennifer's character, was chasing after the weasel, and it was she was bouncing off walls and stuff, and the animators were doing a really good job with that, but just the animals, I mean, it had to be crazy to develop that, and you guys also just had a lot of amazing software, it seemed like, with, with FizzGrid, Banzai, and XGen. So can you talk about just what was the next evolution in technology 
going into this movie. And yeah, well, maybe I could talk, possible. and then maybe one of these guys could talk about that a little bit, because I'll talk about the animation part of it first, because one of the things that, uh, and you guys are probably like this too here, when you get something that you're really passionate about, and it's a project, then it doesn't feel like work. And that, that when you give our animators, and we have about, probably about, like, almost 100 animators. Yeah, 90-ish. 90, 90 95. Animators. And so uh, when you can give them something that they love, the work does itself. They will go to 150% on everything. And what we asked them to do on this movie was to not forget that these are all animals. They're not men in costumes. Don't think of them as guys walking around in suits. And uh, they studied every, we have 64, 64 different species of mammal in this movie, all different, all with different rigs, different body anatomy, different fur, different clothing, different scales. We tried to be true to the scale of the animal. So if a mouse is two inches tall in our world, then it's two inches tall in Zootopia. If a giraffe is 25 feet tall in our world, standing on two legs, same thing in Zootopia. And so the animators geeked out. They just said, we're gonna do this. And so, especially with uh, Jennifer and Jason's characters, the fox and the rabbit, they looked at hundreds and hundreds of hours of real fox footage and real rabbit footage. And you'll actually see Jennifer's character, she almost gets stepped on by a rhinoceros in the movie. And when she gets scared, she goes back to the sort of primal instinct and this bunny behavior comes out and she does something very specific that bunnies do called binkying. Look it up, you can Google it. See, I tied you guys in. Of course you can look stuff up, but Google. All right, anyway. So, anyway you can, Have you heard of this well thing, done. Google? I use you all the time. Uh, anyway, so but you can look up binkying and you'll see exactly what Jennifer's character does because that's why we have these geeky animators who love love this stuff, and if you give them uh, these projects, and especially, it's we've done, we've done a lot of films lately with human beings, we've done Frozen and Tangled and stuff, and human beings are fine, but it's nice to kind of mix it up once in a while and give them something new, especially with this movie that had so much variety, they just really got into it. And uh, do you guys want to talk about like the technology? Well, and, and just the the ability to render the fur on the character, the, the looks of, of them, and the grooms, um, and like you said, since Big Hero 6, we have this Hyperion um, system. It's a software uh, that, that allows us just to output tremendous amounts of, of detail and information per frame, you know, when, when we render the film. Um, and so for the first time, we were able to groom the characters, not using like a cheat, you know, on fur, not making it just this kind of stuff that looks kind of like human hair, you know, and I, on Bolt, you guys could barely pull off the scene of, of Bolt sticking his yeah. head out of the car window and, and, and it was a pivotal scene in the movie and it almost didn't happen because the tech department just didn't know how they were gonna pull it off and that was only seven years ago and now we have this system that, that we can groom the characters with hundreds of thousands of individual you know pieces of fur, strands of fur just that are modeled to look exactly like they do you know in the wild so um, our, our technology has just moved forward leaps and bounds in, in presenting a movie like this. Yeah, and I think, I mean, just a couple of quick statistics. So Jennifer's character has 2.6 million hairs on that rabbit, 9 million on a giraffe. So that's a lot every to single have one to, of to go into render. But the most How important many? thing is 9 million on a giraffe. How many it's, on Tommy's character, do you know? Well, it, Tommy's character is... He's not even wearing locked, clothes. So, yeah. yeah. But you do see more of him, <laughs> so there's, there's more exposed. But 64 characters, they studied each species fur under a microscope, discovered that a polar bear's fur is actually clear, that a fox's fur is dark at the root and it gets light as it goes to the tip, that there are dreadlocks on a yaks, that a, you could have an oily kind of look on an otter, so that every single fur groom is completely different. Every animal is a different shape and size, so we can't actually replicate those animals and just change the, the, the size of them and make it different. So you had 64 different models that had to be created, 64 different rigs that had to be created. Then we had to create shaders that would actually allow us to bring that, have light reflect the fur in the correct way so that we, as humans, see it in the right way. And again, with each type of fur being different, the way that light reflects off of the fur is different. So in every shot, they have to think about that for each individual character. And then we said the world had to feel alive, so we needed plants and trees, because that was going to be the most way to make the world feel organic. And we needed that throughout, so for us, we had to go in and, and get bonsai and look at the rainforest district in terms of the density of all of the foliage that is in that one area. And then on top of that, we said we wanted to have there be movement, because in any city there's movement. So we had to create technology systems that would allow us to move the leaves and the branches on the trees and have the fur on the characters actually move in a way that makes it feel, again, realistic, so you keep adding on. And then the last thing, which is huge, and you sort of take it for granted as you start to watch this movie because the characters are walking on too, but they all wear clothes. 
So every single character has a different cloth simulation that has to be figured out, and they're different sizes. So how does that skirt move on an elephant versus on a mouse? Or how does the same thing for a t-shirt move on two different types of characters? So yeah. for how does team, it intersect with fur? Exactly. Of all those different kinds of fur. So, so it was layer on, po on top of layer on top of layer, and each decision was made individually based on what we thought was necessary for the world. But in the end, when you look at all of it, it was a little daunting. But again, as, as Byron and Rich have said, our team is so passionate about wanting to create great work, that everybody goes into what they know and they figure it out for you. And it's a thing you just believe in and we're so lucky to get to work with these talented individuals who will go to the ends of the earth to make it happen for you. Yeah, no, it's, it's phenomenal and it's great to just see Disney pushing these types of films and just not you know, resting on your laurels, it's just great. Um, so I'm bringing up Manil from our Google Photos team. Uh, yeah. yeah. Woo so yeah, well, yeah do it. All right, so I get the pleasure of talking about a couple of really fun things we got to do between Google Photos and the folks at Disney for this movie. Um, so we had a similar experience, Byron, as you had. So when I found out we were going to be in Zootopia, I went and found Sundar, our CEO, and I lifted him up. <laughs> and I put him up there like nice. Simba. And I said, we're going to be in Zootopia. You make this a thing. I know. And, uh, you know a, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. Mine did not go so well. <laughs> he, oh. He's still not talking to me. But anyway. Um, it was, it was just such a great experience when we found out about this movie, and we knew we had to be a part of it because, I mean, if there's a universal truth, right, other than death and taxes, it's this. Humans and animals both suck at managing their personal photos, right? <laughs> they take way too many slots, take way too many selfies. Hippos always forget to take their phones out of their pocket when they have a bath, right? So we knew we wanted to be part of this movie and be able to help with those problems. And so uh, in addition to having a little clip in the movie, uh, which we really enjoyed. Uh, we also worked with Disney uh, to create another sort of custom clip, which we're gonna show now. Let's cue the video, please. Oh. Listen, we all love our phones. Every day we use our phones for this, like all the time. We take photos at every place, every event, and with every friend we know. You don't wanna lose those moments, but hey, things happen. Phones break. Bye-bye. Or get dropped in the... Tomorrow's another day. Yeah, but it might be worse. Good thing there's Zoogle Photos. <laughs> your memories are automatically backed up, always organized, and completely searchable. Wait, is that all your family? Oh, bunnies. We are good at multiplying. So no matter where you are, you can view your photos anytime. Well, almost anytime. Zoogle Photos if you live in Zootopia. But if you live anywhere else, there's Google Photos. Disney Zootopia, in theaters March 4th, rated PG. Oh, that was very oh, nice. Pretty nice. Nice good. Done. All right, so that was it's that okay. was really fun. And then the other thing we got to do is we actually got to go ahead and have a little fun at the premiere. So we got to uh, go down to the Zootopia premiere, which was a couple of weeks ago down in LA, and we got to actually go down and uh, do some fun things at the red carpet. Now, this was my, personally, I think this was my 32nd red carpet event, 33rd? Maybe, actually, no, I'm miscounting, sorry. This was my first one ever. Wow, um, cool. And so it was pretty awesome, right? It was a really great experience. You guys were even so nice as to set me up with a fake interview. I really appreciate that. I think this was The Onion, so I'm waiting for that article to come out. Um, but it was just a great experience. And so once all us riffraff like me got off, uh, you know, obviously the real talent came on, and we wanted to have a little bit of fun. So what we did is we set up an installation to take photos. And so we went ahead and took photos, and Nate, try to control yourself. Shakira um, Nate. We, we, took, we created an installation where we took photos from the vantage points of the animals. So here you've got what, if we were in Zootopia, we were taking a photo of Shakira, what it would look like if we were a lion. But what if we were a giraffe taking a photo of this event? It would look kind of like this, right? And you'd have that experience. And of course, this is what it would look like if it was a gerbil. So not quite the full scope, but we got to have a little bit of fun with it, with this installation. We got some great photos, of course, of Shakira. We, um, let's see here, who else we've got? Uh, here's Jennifer. Yeah. Beautiful. So this was a fun experience. We didn't get to see the shoes as much. The gerbil didn't get much there. Uh, we've got, let's see. Okay. The Idiot Squad. Uh, is, <laughs> Byron, is that your tux? Yeah, man. Is that your tux, Byron? Yeah. With the shoes? Oh, the, oh, the, oh, the leopard you, fans? Leopard tux. Leopard yeah. tux. It's we nice. Skimp. You, your Styling. entertainment is important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, got, we got Nate. Yeah. Nate. 
It rained. Those it shoes. rained on my shoes. <laughs> it was so <laughs> wet. Cool it was very rainy. It was a rainy day. Yeah. Everyone was so. It was not. It was not good for that way. Yeah. Okay. So this was uh, Jason. Jason. We got some good photos of. We got uh, Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we there could get Tommy is. to stand in one place for too long, so we couldn't get all three photos. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, and of course, we had Katie. Oh, look at that. Very oh, happy. Oh, is there. There's Adam. <laughs> oh, so that was bring your husband to work day too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it was a really great experience. All these photos are up uh, on Zoogle Photos, uh, so everyone can have a look and, and uh, enjoy the uh, join the album. But it was a great experience, and we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be part of it. So thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so we're gonna move to audience questions. If you guys want to head up to the oh, people are running. Uh, I had a chance to see this at D23 with my younger daughter. She thought it was fantastic, or clips from it. And the question I asked there, I want to ask here, because I thought it was a great uh, answer, was I saw a lot of uh, things about unconscious bias in the clips that I saw, and that's a big topic here at Google. Was that just something you thought about, or coincidentally it worked out as something relevant now? You know, it's, it's oddly timely, this movie, and you know, it, wasn't, it didn't start that way. But one of the things that came up when we were doing that year of research is we found a very interesting fact about the mammal world, and that's 90% of the animals in the mammal world are prey animals, and 10% are predators. And we actually say that in the movie. One of the characters says that. And we thought, that's really interesting. If you think about those two groups that are not equally balanced, if they've really stepped into the future and put this eating thing behind them a couple thousand years ago, and evolved. figured it evolved past it, and they made this incredible uh, civilization, did they completely put aside that mistrust of each other that existed so long ago? And that was one of the major kickoffs of what the story became. And what actually became the main uh, issue between Nick and Judy, like if you watch Jennifer and Jason's character, that's what they're struggling with through this whole film. And the fact that you see Hobbs, who is this amazing Frank Capra-esque character that has this beautiful core and wants to do something good in the world, struggle with something that she didn't know existed within her. It, it, made the, it gave the movie layers which I don't think anyone expected. And it, as we went through the story, it kept building and building and building. And we never set out to make preachy message movies. We hate movies like that. We want to just have people experience the films through the emotional journey of the characters. And so that's what we uh, really appreciate about what these guys gave us, because the natural performances, and we have great writers. Uh, our co-director, Jared Bush, and uh, Phil Johnson, who is his co-screenwriter, wrote a very smart script. And we had to be very careful about what the movie was saying and how it was saying it. But it wasn't intentional, but we're glad it happened, and we're glad people are talking about it. So I've seen the extended preview at Disneyland, and it looks so good. My family is so excited about it. Um, I have a question for Jennifer. So you play Snow White on Once Upon a Time, and you recently said that you go to Disneyland every week. Month, well, yeah, once a month, which is once, still once a month, once probably a month. not healthy. But do you, do you, <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. Let's not uh, be crazy do you, now. Do you ever pretend to be Snow White when you're interacting with the characters there? <laughs> no, I I actually leave the um, the Snow White job to the ladies with the with the bobs and the like 40s red and yellow dresses. Um, I actually because. Our audience for Once Upon a Time are typically Disneyland goers. We sometimes go in disguise because, and I really love this, Disney actually, they, they don't want us to cause a scene because they want there to be. Yeah, they, they give you escorts. Right, well, and, but, yeah. they want, but I feel like it's for such a cool reason. It's not like a, it's not like a Hollywoody reason. It's that they want the kids to, to gather around Mickey Mouse and to gather around, you know, Winnie the Pooh. And like, those are the Disneyland celebrities. And I respect that so much, because that's, I mean, I gather around them too. And so, uh, so yeah, so we usually like try and be a little incognito at the park. Hi, um, this question is for Tommy. So I grew up like watching your movies and I saw you live in San Francisco about seven or eight years ago. It was amazing, my laugh, like, I couldn't stop laughing, my face like hurt so bad afterwards. Um, so my question is, how do you think your character is different from like the Cheech and Chong movies to like this character now? What was the question? How, how, is, there, how is this character that you're playing now a little bit different than when you were in your Cheech and Chong? Well, uh, not really. <laughs> 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 I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a yak, that's about it. <laughs> It's the T-shirt. He doesn't wear the T-shirt. naked. <laughs> what you saw was me. <laughs> and our characters, too. You know, we, uh, 
uh, Cheech and I would find the most ridiculous, uh, weird characters that we could find that were real, that everybody saw every, every day. And that's what the, the strength of this movie is that, you, you, know what, you know what this movie really did to me? I mentioned it before, is that it made me appreciate humans more. Because instead of having one view of what a human should look like, uh, the, the, this movie showed you that m humans come in all sizes and shapes and, and beliefs and, and, and tribes and everything. And it just, that movie, everybody fit in that movie. There was a place for the hippos and there a place for the giraffe and a place for the little tiny people. And so, and, and that's what uh, uh, made Cheech and Chong so popular is that we, we took real people. You know, we didn't have to invent anybody. The, the people that we portrayed were, you know, our neighbors and, and people that we knew. So it, was a, it, was a, it wasn't a stretch at all for me. Thank you. So I, the, the movie was fantastic, but I also love all the, the more subtle call-outs that, that were in the movie. Um, some of them were subtle, like the carrot on the back of the phone or uh, the Zuber or mouse card or that sort of idea. And some of them were a lot more overt, like uh, the Breaking Bad stuff and the Frozen jokes and so on. <laughs> how do you decide how to like, how do you manage all of that? Because that's really, for, for me as a viewer, that's really dense. And I have, and I, and I love it and I have no idea how you guys decide what to put in, when you decide to do it, how that creativity comes about. I find that fascinating. Well, when, when we're working in the story room, we, uh, we encourage all that stuff from from our story artists, just from our writers, just uh, just lay it on thick. You know, it's like we had so many like puns for like or like joke signs for different you know uh, businesses that were animal puns, and I think it's the stuff that really makes us laugh, you know, or the ones that really make us groan the most, you know. Or, or whatever seems appropriate for the moment, it's like, then it's in, you know? It's, it, there really isn't a formula or, or um, any specific recipe of doing it. It's just um, how much can, we, we just create tons of it, you know, just uh, tonnage of, <laughs> of this stuff, you know, and, and just try to plug it in where, where it's appropriate. And then we, we actually have to kind of manage it and make sure like, is that is that one sign in that shot? You know, it should be there, and somehow we we just kind of track it with our minds too. And um, it's after since doing this on shows like The Simpsons and Futurama, it's like you kind of you kind it becomes just kind of an innate you know uh, skill that you have in making one of these things that you want to make sure that the whole thing it, you can tell. I mean, after doing this for for a while, you can tell when it's starting to go off balance, if you have too many, if you don't have enough, you know, um, but it's... And there's stuff that we don't even know about. People will kind of slip stuff in and put like license plates, and uh, if you watch the movie, there's a flashback where you see Nick as a little boy, little, a little fox, a, a kit, I guess. When he goes into, he becomes a junior ranger scout, and his troop uh, number is 914, and that's the birth date of the guy who did all the character designs in the movie. So it's all these little, Things or personal things or probably personal birth dates. There's in jokes about our own movies that you probably saw the Frozen jokes. We got those in there, and it's great to have a world like that where you can actually do that and play with it because yeah. the movie begs for it really. Well, because the genre itself wants it's a mirror image of like our world is you know the talking animal things or or that that's what it's all about. That's kind of the the main convention of this genre. So as we were making the film, it became obvious, like, it wanted more, you know, the story wanted more of this stuff, you know, and we, we were happy to oblige. Awesome. I've got a question about um, character creation process. In particular, I was curious, do you pick an animal and then figure out what the personality is, or do you have a personality in mind and pick an animal? How does that kind of work when you anthropomorphize people that way? I guess we start with sort of the story need. I guess we like uh, the the sloths are a good, good example because we were <laughs> we were kind of brainstorming. Uh, okay, well, what would animals do in this world? And Jim Reardon, who's jobs, jobs and stuff. Know, what what would be an interesting location for yeah. Judy to go to? Yeah, like what are appropriate things for these animals to do? And we have two heads of story: Jim Reardon, Jim Reardon and Josie Trinidad, both really brilliant people. And Jim 
said, well, you know, it's like, uh, if it was a DMV, it should be staffed by sloths. And he just sort of said it was off the cuff, and he was sort of like, ah, oh, that's not going to go anywhere. And we're like, oh, wait. Wait, wait a minute. That's, <laughs> has, that's, has that ever been done? You know, like, <laughs> somebody has to have done that, we thought. And I was like, no, so no one had ever done Google. it. We went to Google. And we went to Google. Has anyone ever put sloths? Wait a minute. Did we just find something really, really cool, you know, yeah. that, that hasn't been done before? And it's it just, just kind of off. moments like that, you know. The, the, and, and we tried to go... That was a case of, of going to type, you know, with the animal. And then we would try to go against type for, for our others because we didn't want the world to be like a storybook animal world where, you know, they're all kind of doing their appropriate jobs and it's all very black and white. And uh, we wanted it to, to, to be different shades of gray, you know, that, like our world, you know, that it was yeah. more complex than, than, you know, like a storybook book yeah know, talking animal world and, and maybe the exception to some of that is that with the lead characters the characters are really driving the story like judy and nick judy we picked a rabbit because uh it, with these movies and with uh when you we need to root for someone you want them to be as much of the underdog as possible so the more obstacles we could put in her way including how cute she is she's teeny she's cute and uh, there are female cops on the police force, but they're all huge animals. There's a huge elephant, and there's uh, po female polar bears and female tigers. But Judy, as a rabbit, has this kind of ridiculous idea of being this big, tough cop in this world. And so the more you kind of go, well, that's ludicrous. She's never going to accomplish that. That's great for us, because that gives Jason's character, the cynic, who grew up in Zootopia and has been sort of ground down by this world, able to kind of poke at her and kind of poke at that sort of Frank Capra idealism that she has and it's great story fuel for us because if we don't have that conflict then because in that case we'll, we'll really think about that for a while because the other people in the story trust were poking at Nick's character like well should he be a fox or should he be a, like a big tiger or something that's got more sort of size contrast but what we liked about the fox is they have this great uh, sense of like uh, cunning and sneakiness that you expect and Jason was perfect for that and they, their chemistry was great but then, um, you know, we want, wanted to also keep uh, Nick as a small predator so that in those scenes, there's a scene where um, Jennifer and Jason's characters are wedged between two huge polar bear thugs in the back of a limousine and they're being driven off to be killed. And that's great because you want that threat to be there. Constantly. As a duo, they're, they're underdogs as well, you know. Yeah. Mr. Big. Mr. Mr. Big, right? <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for coming over and, and, and telling us about all of this, and especially in bringing some of these other things that we won't get to see in the movie, and, and, but you obviously thought a lot about and thought a lot about creating and how they interact with this world. Do you feel like there are more stories that you, you can tell in this, or are we going to get a chance to see some of these kind of realized, especially seeing how well uh, Zootopia is doing in uh, early reviews and things like that? Please, Clark. Please, please, come on, Clark, please. Have some more please. money. Well, right to Clark. Can we Clark. make another one? <laughs> you no, know, we I, always hope that that's where we can go. We, we never think of, we never embark on a film thinking, how can this be something with many stories? We always focus on the main story because we have to ultimately create the best story possible and hope the world falls in love with the characters and the world. But secretly, the hard part is, and it's at this moment in time where we all have to let go of this, right? It's mm. going to go out into the world. The world gets to see it. But these characters that we've spent and, and environments we've spent years building and creating end. And it's always hard. It's really an emotional thing to say goodbye to this cast and say goodbye to our team. Because, you know, we work with 800 people and then suddenly we're just three people mm -hmm. trying to think of what's that next idea. So it is always that kind of bittersweet moment. But you do secretly kind of hope you can revisit those characters in the world because we've had so much fun building that and this has been such an incredible yeah. experience. So are you guys it. in if we do another one? <laughs> can we count on you guys? You want to come back to Vancouver? Come back to, yeah. <laughs> I'll, come yeah. back to Vancouver. I'll go back. I, I will say that we some of these stories, I'll give you an example. So the, the movie Clark and I worked on about seven years ago, Bolt, is sort of a closed-ended story. The dog and the girl are happy on the farm together, and it's sort of it's buttoned up, nice and clean, and you can walk away, and kind of that story exists in that little envelope. Um, this was built with so much potential. I mean, these guys, oh, I won't spoil the end for you, but there's so much potential of where you could go. Um, with the world, and even the things we were talking about earlier, things we couldn't include that are so much fun and so compelling that when you mention them to people, people go, oh my God, that would be great. And then, uh, so uh, the, the, uh, hopefully, okay, we'll see how it does when it goes out in the world. But so I, I, I would love to come back to this world sometime. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, I mean, as he said, it's, it's getting, you know, 
critical just praise and everyone loves it, saying like 100% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. Like it's just, it's crazy. And just Disney seems to be, you know, hitting on all cylinders now and in and, and this new golden age and stuff. It's just, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. You guys are just amazing. So thank you guys so much for being here. And uh, uh, Zootopia comes out March 4th. So go see it. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you Thanks, guys. Google.